Let us pray. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. May we always listen to what you are saying, Lord, for you are speaking peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we spend time together in Holy Scripture today, I want you to keep in mind verse 8 from Psalm 85, which reads, I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. As you keep this verse in mind, ask yourself, am I listening to what God is saying? And if not, then who am I listening to? Now let's begin by focusing on our Old Testament passage from the book of Amos, for there is a lot to unpack in this reading. The events of the book of Amos took place roughly in the middle of the 700s BC. The Jewish people are at this point divided into two nations, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. It was the northern kingdom to which the prophet Amos was called by God to preach. And as we see with many of the Old Testament prophets, Amos did not come with happy news. No, Amos was called to prophesy against the hollow prosperity of the kingdom of Israel under the reign of King Jeroboam II. Israel as a nation dishonored God with their unrighteousness and God's justice was nigh upon them. Our first reading begins in chapter seven, which reads, this is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. Amos chapter seven, verses seven through eight. I always love Amos's response here. So matter of fact, and almost to a fault. What do you see, Amos? Well, I see a plumb line. Good job, very observant of you. So in his dialogue with Amos, God speaks of setting a plumb line, and the Lord isn't talking about fruit here. A plumb line, sometimes called a plummet, is a cord with a weight fastened to one end, and it was used to measure how straight a wall or a building stood. The plumb line would be hung, and the weight caused it to hang straight down. Once hung, the plumb line served as a standard of true vertical, to which an inspector could compare a leaning wall. The plumb line was a perfect standard, and if the wall was found to be leaning a little too far from the standard, it might be repaired. Or, if the wall was far too crooked, then it would be torn down. We might compare this today to a chalk line used by builders, where tight chalk coated string is snapped down to create a perfectly straight reference line. Reading the passage, I was reminded of a level one might use when working around the house. You see, my wife and I recently moved to a new apartment in North Situate, about a stone's throw away from where the Galloways once lived. As is customary for a new move, I spent last weekend hanging blinds on all the windows. The blinds come with a hardware kit, which contains screws and brackets for mounting the blinds on the window. And the instructions recommend also using a level to make sure your blinds are straight. But for anyone who's ever hung blinds or curtains when you first move into a new place, you know that after fighting with a couple windows, things get really old really fast. There's this great internal pain that comes with fighting against blinds and windows all day. It's terrible. So you want to save time so that you don't have to hang blinds all day. So you don't spend much time making sure each set of window blinds is perfectly level. No, you're tempted to cut corners. Really, you want everything basically running parallel to the window. So can get away with eyeballing it for the most part. See, we do this sort of thing in our lives all the time. 
we have a perfect standard, a level or a plumb line, and we ignore the standard to replace it with our own for convenience. We tell ourselves, eh, this should be good enough. This attitude may work for mundane tasks and chores here and there around the house, but do it too often and we let our standards slip and suddenly everything in your life is crooked. Woe to us if we measure our lives against our own standards and not the perfect standard of God's holy word. When the prophet Amos preaches to the kingdom of Israel, God is speaking out against the unrighteousness which comes from spiritual complacency. Israelites, for a generation, listened to their own voice instead of God's, and as a result, their lives became hopelessly crooked. The text goes on to say, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Amos chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. During this period of time, the predominant global power, the Assyrian Empire, was unable to exert the same pressure and dominance over surrounding nations as it had a century prior. As a result of this external stability, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel, Israel in particular, had a rise in prosperity not seen since King Solomon. But their prosperity was hollow because Israel did not honor God through it all. They left the idols that had been erected in previous generations and continued the worship of them. As the Israelites amassed wealth, they gave lip service to God acting as if thankful for their gifts, but in reality thinking they could manipulate him to give them more stuff. I will never again pass by them, the Lord says. The wall that is Israel has become hopelessly crooked. Amos is not preaching repentance. He is preaching judgment. This wall cannot be repaired. The Israelites have become so crooked in their sin that there is no straightening them out as a nation. So the builder has called for their destruction. Amos is proclaiming God's judgment on an unrepentant nation, one which ignored his voice for generations and made itself fat at the expense of the poor and the helpless. The irony in the book of Amos is that the king and priests do not believe his warnings for they think Israel is entering a new golden age. Yet what Israel faced was not a new golden age, but the last gasp of a terminal illness. And only a few decades later, God's judgment would come as the Assyrians totally decimated the nation of Israel. Make no mistake, while we should be careful not to read ourselves into the Old Testament texts, the rule certainly applies to any nation which for generations makes a mockery of God, which fails to care for the poor and the helpless, one which celebrates sin, calling evil good and good evil, one which sacrifices children to sexual predators in the name of tolerance, one which kills thousands of babies in the name of choice. That nation will not escape God's judgment for long. It is a nation which measures itself by its own standards and listens to its own voice instead of God's. And the same warning applies to God's church, too. As a church, we need to decide what type of people we're going to be. Who are we going to listen to? Are we going to be blown about by the winds of culture, taking up every popular cause? Or will we be grounded in the bedrock of Christ. Let's take a moment to look at our passage from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where Paul reminds us of who we are. We have Paul's long greeting from chapter one, and the main point comes about halfway through the reading. In him, 
in Christ. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Jesus Christ died for our sins, in whom we have salvation by grace through faith. It's not our grace. It's not our work. It's not our wisdom. It's not our riches. We don't save ourselves. We can only dig our own hole deeper. No, as a church, if we're looking for blessings and comfort from the world, we're going to fail each and every time. And for perhaps all of us here, the last year has proved that to us. But we need look no further if we want riches. God has lavished us in the riches of the grace of his son, Jesus Christ. Now let's look a few verses down. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in him, in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. We have an inheritance, but it's not here. If you listen to the world, you won't hear that, however, and you can see it in how people act. If this world is all there is, then there is no higher cause than the self-preservation and the accumulation of wealth. As the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 32. This is true also of the church, when she abandons the gospel to seek the affirmation of the world, seeking comfort and safety over worshiping the one true and living God. The text again reads, predestined according to the purpose of him. That is, our true inheritance has been predestined in Christ. This is our great comfort. In Christ, we are predestined to salvation, guaranteed to spend all eternity with him. God makes no mistakes. He is working even in the apparent chaos we see in the world around us. He has known from eternity past who we are, where and when we would live, and even numbered every single hair on our heads. And in Christ, our inheritance of salvation has been secured from all eternity. Can you even wrap your head around that? God's love for us is so inconceivable. You won't hear that from the world. The text reads further. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed and promised with a promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Pay attention to that verse at the bottom of the passage. Where is the word of truth heard? Is it in the news? Is it on social media? On Netflix? No. The word of truth, the gospel of salvation, is heard in Christ Jesus. Like the Ephesians, when we listen to Christ and believe in him, then we receive the Holy Spirit, who guarantees our inheritance now. We don't have to wait. The New Revised Standard Version calls it an installment of our inheritance. I love that. It's like a down payment. The Holy Spirit literally unlocks the grace available to us in Christ, empowering us to the work of ministry and evangelism. This brings us now to Mark's Gospel, where Jesus charges the Twelve with their mission. Listening to the call of Christ requires action. It requires us to go out into the world, into our parks, our neighborhoods, and our communities, 
preaching the gospel and making disciples. And this passage sticks out in our memories, I think, because we always remember that Jesus tells the twelve not to take anything for their journey. No food, no backpack, no money, not even extra clothes. The point here being that extra stuff weighs you down. I mentioned moving between apartments earlier on, and one thing I think everyone can agree on is that when you move, you're reminded of how much stuff you accumulate. It's awful, especially when you have to move it all. Except I had some friends who helped me with moving the heavy stuff, so I guess it wasn't too bad. I can't complain. But with almost no effort, we gather up and we drag around all these possessions that amount to little more than junk. We hardly use it all. All it does is weigh us down. And for our entire lives, we box it up and we move it from place to place. And then we die and we tell our kids, ha, it's your problem now. So the 12 listen to Jesus, and this is exactly what he warns them of. Not that having stuff, having possessions is inherently bad, but too much stuff, too much clutter will weigh us down and distract from our mission. Our priorities will get all messed up. The world tells us, the more, the better. You need more. Buy, buy, buy. What we face then are two different voices offering two different standards, two different perspectives. If this world is all there is, then we might as well listen to what it says and buy more things to make us happy. That second perspective, however, is this. We know that our inheritance is eternal. In Christ, we have been baptized into eternal life with him. And that starts right here, right now. And if we desire our friends, our families, and our neighbors to be saved from eternal punishment, then the words we share must come from Christ and not ourselves. If we listen to Christ, the embodiment of God's perfect moral standard, then our walls will be straight and we won't be found lacking. If we listen to Christ, then when the culture tries to shout us down, we can shake off the dust from our feet and not be distracted by the trouble of the day. As a church, then, we must decide. To whom are we going to listen? God's word or the world around us? I pray that God grant us to hear understand, and obey the call of Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amen.